Okay, so welcome everyone to the Student Supporting Israel webinar with uh, Elada Stormeyer, the spokesperson of the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. Elada, we're very excited to have you here with us. And uh, just a little bit about Student Supporting Israel for the people who don't know. We are a pro-Israel grassroots movement that operates in over 50 college campuses and universities across North America in the United States and Canada. And we are hoping that the school year is going to start just like it always is supposed to start. And so we can go back to our action and back to our activities on campus. So I want to introduce our speaker today, Elad Stormar, that has been a member of the Israel's diplomatic corps since 2010. And in July 2018, Elad assumed his role as a spokesperson of the Embassy of Israel to the United States in Washington. Now, Elad will continue with his introduction because he asked us that he would like to introduce himself a little bit more. But thank you everyone for joining and enjoy the webinar. And for any questions, please write them in the chat. We'll be asking questions at the end. Thank you. Baba Ilan, thank you very much. The reason I want to introduce myself is that I also find it embarrassing when people say things about me. Uh, I didn't get used to that, so it's easier to make it short and brief when I do it. Uh, but Ilan, thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here with you virtually. And I want to also thank uh, Eden Litvin, who's uh, helped organizing this, and uh, her initiative made this happen. So, Todaraba Eden. And I hope you're having fun on the beach right now. We wish that we could be with you. So today I'm going to speak about uh, Israeli diplomacy in the United States of America, about our work here as diplomats, my work as spokesperson, general uh, uh, diplomacy in the 20th century, 21st century, uh, and the differences and challenges. So um, I'm going to speak, and if you have questions, just write them, and then I'm going to answer. This presentation will be a brief one, not a long one, so we can have time for discussion and conversation. So, a little bit about myself, who I am, uh, Elad Stromer, like you've heard. Uh, I grew up knowing that I want to do something for my country. I grew up in a very Zionist home. My parents were active in teachers union and, and in political parties in Israel, and my dad volunteers for the police, so I always knew I wanted to do something for my country. Uh, started after the military, I joined uh, the Jewish agency and I went to become a summer camp sheliach. You can see me here jumping and singing in summer camp. Uh, I've done that for five summers. And then after that, I got a full-time job at the Jewish agency for Israel. I was in charge of uh, Israelis who went to summer camps all over the United States. Um, and I, during that time, I also studied international relations and political science, always knowing, like I said, that I wanted to serve my country. But then I developed the passion for international affairs and actually to become a diplomat. And I joined the Israeli Foreign Service in 2010. I was sent to my first posting in Luanda, Angola, where I was the deputy ambassador. Second posting, I was deputy consul general in Philadelphia. And then I came back to Israel uh, and I was three years in charge of Canada-Israel relations from Israel. Um, so that was uh, a nice gig that I got to travel to Canada a lot. And being a diplomat and also in charge of the Canada portfolio came with perks. And this is one of the perks. Uh, I got to meet Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, I organized his visit to Israel when he came to the Shimon Peres funeral and I accompanied his visit. Um, so this is just one of the little perks and things that uh, Israeli diplomats do, but we work much on a much wider scope than that. And like you've heard today, I'm the spokesperson of the Embassy of Israel in the United States here in Washington, D.C. That was my short introduction about myself. And now I want to talk about the uniqueness of Israeli diplomacy. Now, if we were standing um, together, I would open up for questions and, and get from you a little bit, what do you think is unique about Israeli diplomacy? So maybe you can write that in chat, but we cannot now start unmute everybody. It'll be a mess. Um, so what I see as the uniqueness of Israeli diplomacy is that we work in unique environments and we are creative and we're a small diplomatic core. So here, for example, what you see in this picture uh, is an activity that we have done in Angola when I was deputy ambassador there. And uh, we try to see what can we do in this country aside from the traditional diplomacy, which I'll elaborate 
pay more. And I brought uh, Medical Clown, which is something that Israel is actually very famous at and good at, um, to work in Angola and to train Angolans to become medical clowns as well. And here she volunteered in an orphanage um, and did some, bring some joy, brought some joy to the kids in the orphanage in Angola. And we got good publicity there and we coordinated and co uh, cooperated with government offices. So the idea, what I see is the uniqueness of Israeli diplomacy is thinking out of the box. Think, thinking out of the box with their very, very limited resources that we have. Uh, because despite what everybody think about Israel, that we're a superpower, and we are, we're very strong and very resilient country, we're still a small country and our resources are limited. And in our diplomatic work, we need to find ways to utilize that. So that's one element of the creativity, thinking out of the box, utilizing um, very minimal uh, resources. The second element, which I think uh, is unique about Israeli diplomacy, is that, again, people don't know that, but we're a small diplomatic corps. So, for example, in this picture, what you see is basically the entire team of the consulate in Philadelphia, aside from the consul, gen consul general who's not in the picture. But you see myself and our local staff working, used to work at our consulate in Philadelphia. We were a very small mission. For example, here in Washington, D.C., in our embassy in Washington, we're considered a big embassy in Israeli terms. We're 10 diplomats. That's it. Um, just to compare, only in Angola, the United States had 35 diplomats, and that considered a very, very small U.S. mission. So we're a small diplomatic corps, limited resources, so we need to be creative. We need to find unique ways to reach audiences and to bring the Israeli message. And I think this is one of the unique things about uh, Israeli diplomacy. And that's something actually unique to Israel because we are a small country that needed to deal with a lot of challenges. We found creative ways to deal with that. And that is actually the story of Israel. If you haven't read, I really recommend it, Startup Nation. It's not a new book anymore, but it really tells the story of the uniqueness of Israel, how this small country became a powerhouse in the tech scene in the world. And that's part of it, of the creativity and ingenuity of the Israeli mind, so to speak. So we translate that to diplomacy as well. So uh, we are here in the United States and uh, I wanna talk a little bit briefly about the special relations between Israel and the United States. And so you can, uh, I'm framing that so we can use that as a, base to the conversation about our work here in the United States. So I like to frame the relationship in three letters, VIP. Now people, when uh, you hear VIP, uh, usually you think very important people, very important person, but the VIP that I refer to is different. And V stands for values, which is the shared values between Israel and the United States. That's something that we emphasize all the time. And this is what we do in our diplomatic work on a daily basis to emphasize the shared values between our two countries, democracy, rule of law, freedom of speech, uh, open society, multicultural and diverse society, the idea and essence of diversity that makes us stronger. So that's one very important uh, pillar or anchor, if you want, for the Israeli-US relations, this is the V, the value. The second is I, interests. Uh, like anything, and if you study, I don't know, people here study different, different things, but in international relations, when I studied that, everybody talked about that the basis for relations between countries is shared interest. You can cooperate if you have a shared interest on something. So Israel and the United States are no different. In order to have these special and strong relations between Israel and the United States, we need to find common grounds. We need to find shared interests. And this is something very evident today in our relations. And this is something that we do here in Washington and in our consulates in the United States to enhance uh, the shared interest and the mutual interest. Because everybody thinks that when we talk about Israel-US relations, what Israel has to gain from these relations, because the United States is the superpower, Israel is a smaller country, but we also frame the conversation differently. What the United States has to gain from a relationship from Israel? And you'd be surprised or not, the United States has a lot to gain uh, from a relationship with Israel. So we'll talk about that. And the P stands for politics, because what we do eventually, diplomacy, it's political work, but on the international level. And when I refer to politics, 
I always emphasize that relationship between Israel and the, in the United, and the United States transcend the political party lines. They transcend the political division. And this is what we should strive for. We should focus on the bipartisanship. We should focus on the friendship that is beyond parties, regardless to reality that people try to push Israel as a political issue and make it a political issue. We should not make, let that happen. Uh, the friendship between Israel and the United States is much stronger than one political party or another. So these are the three pillars to understand the special and the strong relations between Israel and the United States, our shared values, our shared interests, and the fact that Israel is a non-political issue, is a non-partisan issue in the United States, it sends their political division. So how do we do that? How do we strengthen the relations? Um, and here I wanna talk a little bit about the role of the embassy. We at the embassy, um, you see the picture of our outside of the embassy, it's a secret, you can find it online. Um, we at the embassy, we work in various levels to strengthen this relationship. And now I wanna elaborate a little bit on how we do that. So I'm actually gonna skip the first one and I'm gonna talk about working in several layers. So we're working first and foremost as diplomatic representative uh, with the US administration. The White House, with the National Security Council, with uh, the State Department and other government agency, USAID, for example, uh, we work together and we collaborate on many levels. We're strengthening what we call the bilateral relations between Israel and the United States. Um, that's one level. The second level that we're working on, because what we talked about, uh, the bipartisanship element, is working with Congress. Now, these the work with Congress has two, uh, two main reasons. First, like I said, uh, in your system, um, the administration represents one political party and Congress represents all political parties. Mainly here, you have two political parties. So we need to work uh, with Congress to maintain the bipartisanship and the relations with the two uh, sides of the aisles. The second reason is, is that in your system, Congress has a very significant importance despite the strength of the administration. So there is also uh, uh, another idea of working around it because of the importance of Congress to the uh, US system. And the third level, the third layer is the state level. Because of the federal system, uh, a lot of things uh, are happening at the state level, in the municipal level. So this is what we do as well. We work with local and state government uh, on enhancing our relationship economically, um, and, and uh, in public diplomacy. And again, I'll give you some examples on that. And that brings me actually to the diplomatic representation in the United States, uh, which is very wide actually. We have eight consulates all over the United States. And the reason for these consulates is because they work on the state level. They work with the governors. They bring governors to Israel and mayors and, and, and help develop the relationship on the state level because it's eventually also in the system. One of the governors can become President of the United States. You know, the presidents, when they come here, and congressmen, when they come here, they're not in Washington. They come from Wyoming, from Ohio, from California, from Pennsylvania. So we need this arm, this stretch all over. We cannot do that alone from Washington. So this is what the consulates are doing. They're building this relationship in the state level. And that brings me to the difference between political work and public diplomacy. And here at the embassy, it's very evident that a big chunk of what we're doing is political, which means that we work uh, with the political actors, uh, mainly as diplomats, we work mainly with the State Department, but not only, like I said, with the administration and Congress on many levels. And we meet our counterparts and make the case for Israel and we find ways to cooperate and, and ask questions and we're trying to cooperate on issues that are important, for example, Iran is one of Israel, it's the number one actually issue that Israel is working on and we work very closely with the American administration on that, with the State Department, with the White House, with the National Security uh, Council, with Congress. We all the time maintain the dialogue on this issue. Iran is just one example, there are many others uh, on, on the agenda when we discuss with our counterparts here on the administration. So the political work is the, what we call classic diplomacy. 
it's going to the State Department, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, if it's a different country, and make the case and present our interest and ask for the support and vice versa, see how we can, how we can support um, America in areas that they want. So that's political work. Public diplomacy is diplomacy in the 20th and 21st century, is reaching out to the larger audiences because eventually, um, we're working in a democracy. Israel is a democracy. The United States is a democracy. And your elected officials, whether they're in the administration or in Congress, they don't work in a vacuum. They owe to their uh, position to the American people. So in public diplomacy, we're trying to reach out to the American people and make the case for Israel to maintain and strengthening the friendship between Israel and the United States, it's also not just on the administration and Congress level, it's also on the people to people level. And this is what we do in public diplomacy. And this is a very, very wide scope of things that we can do. And I'm gonna give you examples, uh, but this is extremely important because we have different tools that we use to reach out to as many people as possible. And the United States is a big country and we cannot reach to each and every one of the more than 300 million citizens that you have here. Uh, so we need to find creative ways that's bringing you back to the uniqueness of Israeli diplomacy to do that. I mentioned the bipartisanship when I talked about the AP, and that's really a guiding line for us to maintain good working relations with both parties to make Israel a bipartisan issue to showcase how Israel, for example, through the V of the VIP values, shared values, Israel is an asset to the United States through the shared interest and the shared values. And outreach, like I said, we need to outreach to as many people as possible in order to reach out in our public diplomacy work uh, to as many people par possible. And in order to maintain the bipartisanship, we outreach to different audiences, Jewish and non-Jewish, liberal, conservatives, uh, uh, African-American, Hispanic, uh, a LGBTQ, you name it, we're trying to expand our outreach here in the United States on all the levels, by the way, uh, via Congress on the state level, on political leaders, on public uh, officials, on public uh, diplomacy, like uh, public uh, media people, et cetera, et cetera. So this is overall the scope of our work. And now, as promised, I'm gonna give you examples. So on the political work, on the diplomatic work, we have what we call political dialogues, we're meeting experts on different areas, and we have conversations about that, finding common grounds, finding shared grounds. Sometimes it can be an issue-based dialogue. Sometimes it can be a much wider dialogue. So for example, every once in a while, we have conversation about what is the best way to counter the Iranian threat in the Iranian nuclear program. This is something that is being discussed between Israeli diplomats and our counterparts, between our leaders and our counterparts. And these political dialogues are done in many levels. Sometimes it's in a lower ranking level. Sometimes it can be done even on the level of Minister of Foreign Affairs and Secretary of State or Director General or even the leaders of our country. It really depends on the issue and the importance. Uh, this is something that is ongoing and this is an element that you can see in every diplomatic work, not just Israel, the United States. Uh, that's the basic tool that we're using in classic diplomacy. In addition, and very unique also to Israel, the United States, we have very strong security cooperation in many levels, uh, intelligence sharing, uh, technology sharing on security, uh, we train together and the cooperation between the IDF and the US Armed Forces is very, very strong. And that's something that is done both, of course, by the Minister of Defense and the DOD, but also by the diplomats to find the points that are connected to the political stuff, to the diplomatic stuff. So the security cooperation is extremely important to enhance when we talk about the shared interest. For example, Israel, uh, the only democracy in the Middle East, which I know that sounds like a slogan, but it's not, it's reality. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. It's a haven, it's an island of, of sanity in the Middle East, and it's a very important asset to the United States. From Israel, uh, you can get intel of what's happening in the Middle East, you can get better understanding. So it's a two-way street that Israel and the United States uh, cooperate, and that's, again, just one example of security cooperation out of many. Third element when we talk about that cooperation is the trade, commerce, and economic cooperation. Uh, one of the things that helps, in my idea, 
to bring people together is uh, business. I remember when I studied international relations, I had a professor that said that there was a study, study that showed that countries that have McDonald's in it don't go to war with one another at the time. It was like 20 or 30 years ago. Now, clearly, McDonald's is not a force for peace, right? McDonald's is a business, and they're not the one that create peace in the world. But the idea is that come countries that have open markets, that have open society, that have strong ties with one another, uh, economic ties, are likely less to go to war with one another. So that's the basic element now. When you enhance these ties, the friendship gets even stronger. So Israel and the United States have a very strong economic uh, cooperation and economic ties. And again, it's a win-win situation. It's a two-way street. Uh, Israel is, like I said, startup nation. It's the hub for technology and know-how on these issues. Um, and Israel is also a small country, so we need big markets to expand. And where are these markets? They are worldwide, but they're also for sure in the United States. So Israeli startups, they wanna to come to the United States, they wanna present their uh, shop, they wanna present their technology and their ingenuity here in the United States, knowing that they have better possibilities to expand than a market of 9 million people, which is Israel. It's a win for the, for the Israeli companies, it's a win for the Israeli economy, but it's also a win for the American economy because when they come here, they open their shop here, they open their business center here, and they help create jobs. And when we promote that, Israel and the United States as a win-win, uh, that's something that really helps elevate the level of the relationship between our two countries. And that's really something that people don't necessarily know that diplomats do. We are working on this level, on this trade and commerce and enhancing the economic cooperation, because that can also create closer ties between our people. And we do that on the state level, and we do that also on the federal level. So that's uh, on that uh, front. Media relations, very important. That's my job as spokesperson, to bring the case of Israel in the media. Now, when we talk about bringing the case of Israel, again, there are many layers to it. One of the things is also what we call classic Hasbara, which actually I don't like that word Hasbara anymore. I, I prefer to call it public diplomacy, uh, but it's bringing um, the case for Israel on the main issues that we want. Uh, for example, to make the case on Iran, to make the case on the Palestinian issue, for example, how to make the case regarding the peace plan and what we think should be forward. So that's the classical elements of media relations talking about for political issues, diplomatic issues that are extremely important for Israel. The other element in media relations is to present the other case of Israel, Israel that we call Israel beyond the conflict, Israel beyond the political stuff. We don't want Israel uh, to just be framed in the context of the Middle East and the conflict in the Middle East. So we're basically in our media work presenting, trying our best present to the media the other stories about, about Israel, the ingenuity, the technology, the diversity, the music, the culture, all the beautiful things that all of us love about Israel so much, that's our job to present it. Now, I'll be honest, not easy, not easy because the media, and, and I don't like the term the media is biased or anything, it's much more complicated than that, but the media is very interested in the political stuff, and it's very difficult to make them interested non-political stuff and it's not easy and we're working hard and we're trying to find the angle that it's going to be relatable and important to the local media here to the american media and then that brings me to social media which is another extremely important tool um, today that we use especially when we're trying to reach larger audiences because research today showed that people consume their media and consume their news for example not necessarily from traditional news outlets people don't buy the washington post anymore or the new york times or just turn on the tv to watch the news they either go online to search for things or they even search it on their facebook on their twitter on their instagram so we need to utilize social media to bring the Israeli case, again, on all fronts, on the political hardcore issue, but issues, but also on the soft issues that we wanna present about Israel. And this is, I think, one of the important things that when we talk about Israeli diplomacy in the 21st century, and not just necessarily in the United States, is how we utilize the social media. And Israel is always raking 
very, very high um, on uh, the use of our diplomats in social media. Um, and we have official accounts to the embassies, to the consulates, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we have also individual accounts for the diplomats. And through these accounts, we're trying to make the case for Israel and we reach to very large audiences. And Israel is actually very well respected as a powerhouse in using social media as a diplomatic tool. And there are many examples. The best one I can give you right now is that Israel has very active social media accounts in Arabic and in Farsi that cater to the Arab world and to the Iranian people. When we talk about Iran, for example, we always say, and I say it publicly, it's not a secret, our feud is not with the American, with the Iranian people. Uh, Israel and Iran had wonderful relations in the past before the Islamic revolution, and this is something that can happen in the future. So our problem is not with the Iranian people. They suffer, they suffer from the horrible Iranian regime. But we're that, our problem is, is with the murderous Iranian regime that is trying to annihilate Israel. So we're using social media in Farsi to reach out to the Iranian people and give them the message uh, that we don't have a problem and we want a better life for them as well. We do similarly in Arabic uh, with the Arab world in countries that we don't have representation. We have embassies in Cairo and in Amman, in Jordan and in Egypt, but we don't have a representative in other Arab countries. So we use the social media platform to reach out to people and you'd be surprised, but our platforms, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in uh, social media in the Arab world and in Farsi is very, very popular. People are very interested. So that's again, the uniqueness of how we utilize this tool. So here you can see some examples from work, interviewing, speaking to groups uh, in different areas. So one of them is a demonstration to be pro-Israel. Uh, and you know what? I actually want to focus on that one. I don't know if you see the mouse that I think, but it's this picture uh, on top right of the, uh, of the screen. This is me giving an interview at a rally in 2014 to support Israel during Operation Protective Edge. Now, one of the things that is a uh, spokesperson, they teach you is that when you're interviewing, you're not using this device. You're not holding it in your hand. You're not distracted by it. You need to be very focused on the interview. Now, if you can see on the picture, I'm holding my phone. So I'm basically breaking all the rules that I need to do but there was a reason for that. And again, this is Israeli diplomacy in the 21st century. This is exactly what we do in there. So this is a, a rally to support Israel uh, during Operation Protective Edge. And I had on my phone the app that is still active called Red Alert. Red Alert is an app that gives you an alert every time there is a, an alert in Israel that a missile has been launched towards Israel. And Clearly, you know, in 2014, and not only there were other uh, uh, rounds of that afterwards, Israel got hundreds, thousands of rockets fired at uh, by Hamas militants in Gaza, and the Red Alert app went on time, all the time. So I'm giving the interview, I'm giving all the Israeli talking points like we know how to do, and my phone beeps all the time without stopping. And the reporter during the interview says, what is this sound? It's a bit uh, disturbing to the interview. So I took the phone and I told them, see that? That's an app that Israel developed. So people in Israel can get an alert immediately, even before you hear the siren, of if the siren is not strong enough, or if you have other problems, that they know that they need to go to bomb shelter. Now, oh, you see, there is now a sound. It means that right now, we're standing here in Philadelphia speaking. There are hundreds of thousands of people in Southern Israel that have 15 seconds to go to shelter, to bomb shelters to defend themselves. He was shocked. And I said, maybe for this interview, that is a little annoyance and disturbance, the sound that we're hearing, but in Israel, this sound saves life. And this is what we're doing. We're using technology to save lives, to see how we can make the world a better place. He was shocked about it. The story became how Israel developed an app in order to save life and in order to give an alert and uh, a, 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 in a response to threats from a Hamas militants in Gaza. So that was a win-win for us. I presented our case. I presented our case politically on the war. And I also showed 
technology, I also showed the beautiful face of Israel. And this is what we need to strive and do all the time. Now here, I'm just showing off. I, uh, in Angola, I participated in a talk show there, a uh, very famous talk show. This guy is the uh, Jay Leno of Angola, if you want, or uh, uh, Conan O'Brien of Angola. And, and again, the idea in our diplomacy, and this is what was so unique is in our diplomacy, is to find the local angle. So he's holding a book in his hand, and the book is a Hebrew translation of an Angolan author. Now, clearly here in the United States, it's less exciting because there are so many American authors being translated into Hebrew. But in Angola, to have a, an Angolan author being translated to Hebrew, and here I am, the deputy ambassador of Israel, reading the book, that was a big deal for them to see that the Angolan culture is spreading and, and, and known. So again, it's being relevant and bring the personal angle. You want people to like you, you need to show them that you care about them. This is the basic of diplomacy and for sure the basic of public diplomacy. And this is what we're doing all the time. And we're finding ways to be creative online and reach out to other audiences and, and, and really present the beautiful and the unique and, uh, story of Israel. And that brings me to social media. In social media, we find ways uh, to bring the story, whether it's political story or whether it's nice and good story. So for example, last year, uh, Israel went to the moon with Bereshit and was uh, one of a very, uh, one of the countries in a very small and respected club of countries who made it to the moon. So yes, we crashed. Yes, we didn't land, but we still crashed on the moon. Even crashing on the moon is very hard and not a lot of people can say that they've done that. So here at the embassy, as you can see on our uh, Facebook page, we did a big campaign on that and we did many activities, um, physical activities, but also online activities about this story that Israel got to the moon. And this is again, an example of showing the uniqueness and the technology and the beauty of Israel because space inspires people. Right? It inspires me, I can tell you. So Israel is one of these countries that help inspire people as well. And here you can see our ambassador, he actually went there to the launch and he posted about that. And for me, that's a very meaningful picture of Ambassador Dermer because if you can see, he has his yarmulke on the back, looking at the launcher. And this is again, the symbol of the Jewish state. He's the ambassador of the Jewish state who are sending a vehicle to the moon and, and that's again showing how Israel is special, Israel is strong, and Israel worked together with the United States because the launch was from here in the United States. So that's again, the strong cooperation between our countries. And then there are many other things that we wanna portray. So for example, last year, an Israeli filmmaker, Guy Nativ, won the Oscar, and he was the first Israeli to win the Oscar. So this is our Instagram page. And the film doesn't deal with Israel at all. It deals with race in America, but still an Israeli filmmaker won the Oscar. So for us, that was a big deal. And this is a way also to relate to different audiences saying, hey, we have something in common. We have Israelis here that they care about racial relations here in the United States and racial tension. We have many facets, many faces to us. So this is again, an example to showcase uh, the friendship and how close we are and using it in different platforms. So that's again, one example. And like I said, we also need to tweet about um, uh, political stuff. So in honor of Valentine's Day, I tweeted that this tweet last year, roses are red and so is blood. If these are your friends, I'll help you God. And you can see here, President Erdogan and the Iranian Supreme Leader uh, uh, hugging together and that's, again, an example of how we utilize social media uh, to our benefit and bring our messages, whether it's light messages, whether it's political messages. Here's, again, another example of a campaign that we've done about, uh, together with the IDF, about Hezbollah attack tunnels in the north. Again, it was last, it was uh, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, and we're bringing this message all the time and we utilize every tool that we're doing present these cases. And by the way, we're partnering. We're partnering with different organizations. SSI as well worked very closely with our consulates all over the United States and with our embassy here in Washington um, in order to help spread this message, whether it's the soft message or the core issues like this one. Again, another example, 
that people can relate to. Do you think these are birthday balloons? No, these are explosive balloons that are being sent to Israel. That's something that people can relate to because every kid likes to play with balloons. And all of a sudden we bring this, the reality of Israeli kids in Southern Israel. So uh, uh, that's another element that we're handling and, and, and really focusing in our social media work. And I believe that as diplomats, our job is to bring people together. So this is a older tweet that I've done. A nine years old uh, Syrian girl who was treated by uh, Israeli in a hospital made a drawing. And for me, that says it all. Eventually, uh, we're trying to help people. And with the war in Syria, and in spite of the fact that we have our feud with Syria, the Syrian people are suffering. So we helped, we brought wounded people and sick people to get treatment in Israel. And maybe through that work that Israel did, we helped build bridges. So we need to talk about that, right? We don't need to hide it. So we find different ways. That's one of them, social media. Um, so we can continue with the examples, but I want to reach out uh, to the questions right now. But like you can see, we outreach and community engagements and outreach to the, to the Jewish community. We really uh, do a lot of cultural work because I think like economy, culture is also a bridge. Culture is a universal language, music and dance. So when people are exposed to Israeli culture, uh, they are exposed to the uniqueness of Israel, to the diversity of Israel. And we enhance cooperation on the academic level because eventually, uh, when you have joint researchers together, working together, or when you have student exchanges, again, that helps bring a understand, builds understanding between our people. So I'll conclude with my personal angle, because I think to be a relatable diplomat, whether in person or online, you need to be the true you. You need to bring yourself. You cannot fake it. Um, so this is what I do in my diplomatic work. I talk about my life. I talk about my personal angle. And this is Philadelphia, which is my previous uh, town before coming to the city, a place that is very close to my heart. And in Philadelphia, I got married to my husband, Oren. And I talk about our marriage and I talk about our relationship and I talk about what it means to be a gay diplomat to many audiences. That was not uh, the presentation today, uh, but I do that a lot. And uh, that's, again, me, I think that makes me as a diplomat relatable to people when they hear the story behind it. And then eventually, when I come and speak with people, they still might disagree with me on some issues, but they can relate to me. They can understand where I come from, and they're more open for a dialogue and a conversation. And this is important. And I promised uh, uh, to mention uh, earlier before we started uh, to talk about Ohio. So I also participated in the gay games, the gay Olympics in Ohio. So here you can see the picture when I won gold medal there for sailing. And again, it was 2014 during Operation Protective Edge. And we were on the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which is a very important newspaper in Cleveland and in Ohio, mentioning about the Israeli delegation that came all the way from Israel to participate to, in Cleveland in the Gay Olympics while there are rockets fired at Israel and while their families are in bomb shelters. Again, we showed the uniqueness of Israel, open society, acceptance of the gay community, but also stayed on tune with the political messaging of the conflict of the Palestinian issue of Hamas firing rockets at Israel. So, you need to bring yourself. And I think this is my message to you. And that's where I want to speak and finish. Uh, bring yourself when you advocate for Israel. Bring your voice. When you bring your voice and you bring yourself, you're relatable and people believe you and they connect with you. And even if they still might disagree with you, they are more open to the dialogue. You don't need to speak from talking points, especially not you. You don't represent Israel. I represent Israel. You represent yourself, but you can do a very good service to Israel when you speak about your love to Israel, why you care about Israel, and bringing your personal connection. So that's my personal angle. I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to listen. And Ilan, let's uh, start with questions. I'll be more than happy to answer. Yes, Elan, thank you so much, and I hope that we enjoyed your presentation a lot, and I know that our students enjoyed it. So I'll jump right to the questions, and the first question I'm actually going to ask you from the 
chat that we have here is that uh, your role as a spokesperson is a little bit different than a more traditional diplomat. So can you tell us, clarify a little bit more the differences between a spokesperson position to a traditional diplomat, which is like an ambassador or a consul general? Um, as a spokesperson of the embassy, first of all, I am a traditional diplomat. I'm a career diplomat. Um, this is just because of the size of this embassy and the importance of it. The spokesperson is a separate role from other places. But for example, in other embassies and missions, you do media relations along with your other responsibilities. But because of Washington, because of the importance of Washington in the American media landscape, the position here is separate. Now, my role, uh, yes, unlike my fellow diplomats here at the embassy, I don't have uh, daily relations with the State Department, for example, or other U.S. agencies. I work mainly with the American media. Now, um, I know that I just spoke for around 40 minutes or so, uh, but I think one of the things that spokespeople can do best is actually keep their mouth shut and not and know when it's time to speak and when it's time not to speak and not to talk about something. So I need to find this balance. I need to find a balance. When do I want to go full up front and present the Israeli case? And when do I want to take a step back and not talk about it? That's number one. The number two thing, people think that a spokesperson, I'm going to the media all the time and I give interviews. Now, if you're going to ask my fellow um, uh, journalist, you'll hear their frustration that we actually don't do that as much. We don't go and give interviews. We actually, I prefer to do off the record briefings. I prefer to meet with journalists and brief them separately on the issues and not necessarily speak on the record and have a more in-depth conversation with them on these topics rather than just going on, a, on an interview and give a two minute sound bite. Um, again, I, the reality is that you need to do both find a way that you go an interview, but you need to also do the briefings off the record. And third, and very important as spokesperson, I'm a vehicle to bring other speakers to the media to talk about important issues, whether it's interviews or off the records briefings. So for example, for sure, the ambassador, if the ambassador uh, wants or if there are requests for the ambassador and we want him to uh, uh, give interviews or talk to journalists about important topics for us. Uh, but not only the ambassador, we have the deputy ambassador at the embassy, we have other diplomats and we have visitors in the times that it's not Corona that come from Israel that they can brief on different topics. Right now, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Jerusalem started, because we're still in Corona times, started a project of doing once a month briefings uh, online to journalists uh, about different topics. So we're going to have a briefing about the Palestinian issue, we have, we're going to have about a briefing about Hezbollah, we have, we're going to have a briefing about Iran, and these briefings are specifically catered for journalists. Sometimes they're described as off the record, so it can be a more in-depth. Sometimes they're on the record, depend on the issue. So it's a really very, very wide uh, scope of topics that I deal with. Usually, like I said, when uh, for sure here in the United States, our consulates don't necessarily, in, in their media relations, don't necessarily deal with all the political elements because the interest from local media on these issues is not as high as journalists here that cover the State Department, the National Security uh, Council, foreign policy and, and national security in general. So there is a lot of layers and, and elements of what I do with the media. And I must say it's fascinating because I think free media is extremely important and they have a very important role, even if I disagree with them, by the way, even if they annoy the hell out of me, by the way, I think they're still very important, the media, and I really cherish my work with them. I think it's extremely important. Awesome. Thank you. And then uh, the next question, it's actually, it has two parts to it. So the next question is the following. Uh, right now it's a summer vacation, and also because of COVID, unfortunately, there is no activity on the ground at all. Can you tell us why it is important to focus our efforts on social media, especially for the students. And the second part of the question would be that nowadays there are so many different platforms, let it be Facebook, uh, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, uh, you name it. So is there a, a way for the students to work on all of them or should they put their efforts into one platform specifically 
but like how the students should operate in order to maximize their efforts? Very good questions. So I'll start generally with social media and then talk about a little bit about the platform. So generally, I think that regardless of Corona time, social media is extremely important because social media today is the tool uh, to reach large audiences. This is where, uh, I, you know, we used to say this is where young people are, but this is where everybody are. My parents are on Facebook and Instagram. So, and they're in their 70s. Sorry, mom and dad, that I reached the age. But, um, so everybody is on social media, so we have to be there. We have to have a voice in social media to reach as large audiences as possible. Now, we have a challenge. And I think today in social media, we see what I call, or not only me, many people call bubbles. We like our ecosystem. We like our e echo chamber, I mean, and we are hearing only the voices that we want to hear. So if I'm pro-Israel, I'm going to be in the bubble of the pro-Israel. I'm following all the pro-Israel people. I'm hearing what they have to say. I read with them, share them. I agree with them. And it becomes a very big echo chamber. Social media, we need also to get out of this echo chamber and reach out to the people who don't agree with us, the people who don't like us. Now, clearly... I'm not gonna change the mind of Linda Salsour, for example, about Israel. So she's not my target audience. But there's so many people out there that they're just not informed, that they're just not familiar with the topics and with the issues. And to them, these are the people we wanna reach. And sometimes you as students, these people are your friends, are your co-students, are your coworkers in your summer jobs, are your neighbors, you know, they like you as people because you're their friends, but they don't care about Israel. So when you use social media and they follow you, this helps to spread the word. That's extremely important. Now, that brings me to the topics and to the second part of the question, the platforms. Um, this is why I said, be yourself. Bring yourself to the conversation. If you're, for example, if you study arts and this is what you're passionate about, be very vocal about Israeli culture and art scene. If you are, for example, very keen on, on political stuff, for example, right now here in the United States on the racial tension and the protest for social justice, and you want to find a way to bring also the voice for Israel, talk about diversity in Israel. Talk about minorities in Israel. Talk about the uniqueness of a diversity society, diverse society, and what the United States can learn from Israel, which is a melting pot that people came from all over the world. Now, you need to do that, like I said, in a genuine way, to be reliable. So if there are challenges and problems in Israel, don't hide them. Talk about them and say and show that how despite these challenges, despite these problems, Israel is still striving to always be better and why you care and love Israel so much. So. Find the issues that you care about. Find the issues that are close to you. You study economics, talk about the economic stuff. You study uh, computer science, talk about tech. Um, whatever you are passionate about, this is what you should bring to the conversation. Don't speak about things that you don't care just because you feel that you have to, for example. Bring your personal angle. Now, as for the platforms, the easy answer is be on all. But... Clearly, there are so many platforms, I don't have even the time or the patience to be on all of them as well. So what I would recommend is that you find the platforms that you feel comfortable with. You relate really to Instagram, so be very active on Instagram. And you relate to Twitter, be active on Twitter. Uh, really find a platform that you're comfortable with and, and be an expert on that platform and bring your voice on this platform. Ideally, again, as many platforms as possible, but we all have day jobs and we're all very busy, so you need to find your ways. But And, and also, and I don't want to elaborate more on that, but Ilan, you can do that. There are tools that can do cross things between different platforms that when you tweet something, it can be on Facebook and with Instagram. There are many, many things that you can also do that, that it repeats itself. Honestly, I don't like this cross things because you want to show that you're different on every platform that you have want to show that on Instagram, you might show the softer side of things. On Twitter, you're more political. Facebook, you know, the mainstream. So I like that there's differences with what, with what we post on different platforms. But this is me. It's very individual. You find your voice. You find your way on that. 
And that's very important because we see a lot of times people post the same thing on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, so it is important we kind of diversify. There is no uh, good or wrong on that. It's fine if you want to do that. I'm just saying you need to understand that Twitter, for example, is different than Instagram. And if you do exactly the same thing, it might be counterproductive. If you feel comfortable and the message is right, do that. I'm not saying that everybody now needs to work on all the platforms. Again, find your voice and find the right way for you. Mm -hmm. Great. Our next question is that uh, in the recent uh, months, if not even longer, uh, but we see it now more than before, there is a lot of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on the different social media platforms. And a lot of times when those uh, posts or things are being reported, those platforms write back that those uh, posts did not, uh, uh, they did not uh, violate the community standards. They did not violate the community standards. Is there anything that the state of Israel is doing or anything that we can do more, you know, to fight that hateful and almost that incitement on social media? First of all, thank you for raising it up. It's extremely important. 100% I agree that we have a problem here uh, with incitement and hateful speech and hatred on social media and on different platforms. Um, this is something that should not be allowed to happen. And we're working very hard on that. So first of all, we're having dialogues with the companies about what constituents uh, constitutes a hate speech, what constitutes anti-Semitism, for example. Uh, what's the difference between legitimate criticism on Israeli policy than anti-Semitism and anti-Israel? So this is a conversation that we're having. We have, our, for example, our consulate in San Francisco, where many of the headquarters are, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So they have relations with these companies. Our headquarters in Jerusalem have relations with these companies. These companies have representation also here in Washington, so we have relations with them. So this is an ongoing dialogue. Now, I won't lie, it's not an easy one. Uh, sometimes they disagree with us, and sometimes there are many disagreements. So this is where the community comes in place. We need to be vocal. We need to be clear that there are things that are unacceptable. So when we see an anti-Semitic post or a hateful post, we should report it. And if hundreds of thousands of people are going to report it, maybe these giants will reconsider the community standards. Maybe they'll understand that when hundreds of thousands of people are upset from a specific hateful speech, um, Maybe that's not to the community standard. Now, unfortunately, I say today, um, it's okay uh, to do anti-Semitic attacks against the Jewish state. It's okay to delegitimize the Jewish state uh, in these standards. Um, so while maybe anti-Semitism against individual, it's much easier to tackle, not, not necessarily, but maybe much easier to tackle, but saying, oh, Israel as a Jewish state doesn't have a right to exist, or Israel should not be a Jewish state, or the Jewish state is killing Palestinians and having horrible cartoons that are anti-Semitic in their nature, saying, well, we didn't talk about Israel, we didn't talk about the Jews, we talked about the Jewish state. Well, pointing out these things at the Jewish state, this is anti-Semitism. And we need to better educate people. What is the difference between legitimate criticism towards Israel and where do they cross the line? Um, and it's not easy, and it's an ongoing dialogue that we as diplomats are doing with these companies, but it needs to be done by all of us on social media, with our friends, with our colleagues, and report. Don't be afraid to report, see hateful speech. Eventually, good wins over evil. Don't forget that. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, so for the people that are uh, rushing, we're about to hit the hour, but there are a few more questions that it's important for us to ask. And the next one would be uh, that you're an official representative of the state of Israel and you're active on social media, but so does uh, many hundreds, if not thousands of students who love Israel and also active on social media. What is the difference of the role of the activist who is not an official representative of the state compared to someone who is an official representative of the state and how far the messages can get? How far can it get? It's uh, up to you. Uh, because you are uh, your own people having your own accounts. And this is what I meant when I said, bring your voice. Uh, you decide. You decide what is the place that you want to tackle, what is the voice that you want to bring. Um, and I think, like I said, you should be genuine and bring your voice. 
for example, and again, this is just for the sake of example, if you are more on the left leaning side of the map, um, I think it's totally okay to show your disagreements with what the Israeli government is doing. But if you want to protect Israel, you should say, I disagree with what the Israeli government is doing on A, B, and C, but it doesn't mean that we need to boycott Israel. It doesn't mean that we need to single out Israel. It doesn't mean that we need to take responsibility, for example, from the Palestinians, because when people in the conversation, it's like either you're pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel, anti-Palestinian. If you're more on the left side, you can show that it's not a matter of choosing. You can actually be pro-everything by not singling out Israel. By the way, this is one of the things that I as diplomat am saying as well. I'm saying that if you want to help the, bring the Palestinians to the table, you should not single out Israel all the time. Because aside from the morality of it, that it's wrong, and I disagree with you on the core of it, if you always blame Israel and the Palestinians are not to blame for anything and they don't have responsibility, they don't have an incentive to change their behavior. They will continue with the same cycle over and over and over again. So it's about time that the Palestinians will stand up and claim responsibility. Israel won't shy away from our responsibility. It takes two to tango. So this is the message that I, as spokesperson, give. So I think everybody can say that, that guys, even if you disagree with Israel, one cannot say that the Palestinians are saints and they're doing everything right. It takes two to tango. We need to remember that. Again, this is just an example, but eventually, I think in your social media accounts, bring your voice, bring who you are, bring your opinion. I always said it when I used to work for the Jewish Agency, I used to say it to the Israelis who went to summer camps and the Jewish communities here, they told me, listen, uh, I want to present the official Israeli government stand. I said, well, first of all, if you want to, by all means, it's up to you. But I think you can be relatable if you show the diversity of opinions in Israel. So as, uh, as an emissary of Israel, as someone who wants to represent Israel, as someone who wants to speak for Israel, show the debate, show the people who think on one side, show the people who think on the other side, give your opinion if you want to, you don't have to, it's up to you, bring yourself. So if you don't feel comfortable, don't do that, but show the different opinions and they say, this is what the government thinks. The government thinks that this is the right way to do it. But by the way, there are people in Israel who disagree with that. We're a democracy, we're a pluralistic society. That's what democracies do. This is the best case that we can bring to Israel because then people don't look at Israel as a monolithic uh, entity. They look at Israel at the complexity. This is the voice that you can bring. And we diplomats, we do that as well, by the way. I represent the government, but I also represent the Israeli people. I speak for everybody. So it's my job to show this diversity of voices. Eventually, I'm advocating for my government position. That's easy. That's a no-brainer for me. But I have a responsibility to bring the diversity of the voices because I represent the entire Israel, whether they voted Likud or Labor or Blue and White or the Arab List or Yamina. No matter who they voted for, I represent all of them. So I need to bring their voices and then as a diplomat, I advocate for what my elected government is uh, uh, advocating. Thank you. And uh, you actually answered one of the next questions that we had of what do we do with people who just single out Israel compared to other countries. So it had, you had the answer in your answer right now. now the Singling, last... I, I, I would say something that can be, I would say, controversial or contagious, but I think singling out Israel out of other countries, it's anti-Semitic. Now, I don't think that people who do that are necessarily anti-Semites, and I don't think that they are aware of how anti-Semitic it is to single out Israel out of every country. Israel is a miracle. We love Israel. Israel is unique. But Israel is no different than the United States or France or Brazil or the United Kingdom. We're a country like any other country, despite of all the uniqueness it has for us. And you're making Israel as the sole problem or the issue, I'm sorry, you're singling out the Jewish state, that's anti-Semitic. Even if your motives are not anti-Semitic, even if you are not anti-Semitic, by doing so, you are adhering to the anti-Semitic tropes. And I think we need to say that. We need to let people be aware of that because a lot of people that single out Israel don't mean bad. 
in, really, they don't mean that. They just don't know better. This is our job to educate them. And you can do that best with your personal voice, with your friends, and, and like I mentioned already. Thank you. And then that would lead us to the last question of today. And uh, over the years, a lot since SSI was actually started, we had many, many members within our organization who are members of the LGBT plus community. And it's something that we're very proud that they were some of our top activists. Now, how can we deal with people who say that uh, Israel is spin quashing or with people that uh, blame Israel with some false accusations uh, while knowing that Israel is actually one of the most progressive causes that we can support here. So any advice from you on that? Yes, I'm very happy you brought it because pinkwashing is really annoying the hell out of me, I must say. The, the concept and people when they accuse Israel and pinkwashing, I think again, it's hypocritical. Um, it's on the verge of anti-Semitic. I, I, I would say the verge of anti-Semitic. Uh, because first and foremost, don't mix the two things together. Um, I have a right to present the beautiful things that my country is doing and the beautiful things that my country have uh, has, uh, regardless of the political reality. I have a right to showcase the diversity of Israel. I have to showcase the right to showcase techno Israeli technology. I have the right to showcase uh, uh, the cultural scene in Israel. And yes, I have the right to showcase how advanced Israel is when it comes to the LGBT community. This is regardless to the disagreements on the political issues. And everybody who thinks differently uh, is a hypocrite because you might disagree with the United States on policy, but if the United States want to show their progressive values on certain issues, you don't say, hey, you cannot talk about that because of Trump. You know, a lot of people don't like Trump, for example, and it and, and doesn't matter where each and one of you right now stand on, on President Trump. But let's say for the sake of the conversation, because people don't like Trump, when you want to advocate for America, for your country that you love and you should love, people will say, well, you cannot do that because that's Trump, because of Trump. People, we have a problem here. Put aside the political differences. Put aside if you agree with Netanyahu or Trump or disagree with Netanyahu and Trump. We have the right to showcase the beautiful face of our country. And showcasing LGBTQ rights doesn't have anything to do with the Palestinian issue. So don't, I say to people, don't mix the two. Now, I also say, and I said it numerous times during this conversation, we need to be loyal, lo uh, uh, truthful. We need to be real. So I won't portray a pink picture that everything is perfect. You should portray when you talk about LGBT uh, rights in Israel, like, by the way, talking about any topic about in Israel, you need to show the reality. You need to show how advanced Israel is, how progress was made, but how there are still many things that, that can move forward and how this achievement was achieved thanks to the work of civil society organizations and activists. You don't just tell the story, oh, Israel is perfect for the gay community. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. Gay pride in, in, in Tel Aviv is the largest in the Middle East. Boo-hoo, it's not a big deal, you know, the Middle East, largest gay pride there. Not a big uh, competition. Um, so if we do only that, I can understand why people will think it's pinkwashing because they would say, oh, you're portraying a very uh, misleading picture. No, you should showcase the challenges. You should co sh showcase how we got to the place that Israel is so friendly and so good to the LGBT community. Show the real story. When you do that, it's easier to say, guys, this is regardless to the political. Don't mix this two. Uh, not easy because when people have their uh, opinion presets on them, uh, it's very difficult to change them. But again, those who hate us, they're not my target audience. My target audience are those who don't care, those who are uneducated, those that might be critical but don't know much and they're open for a dialogue. So bring yourself, tell your story, be who you are and open this dialogue with people physically and virtually in every platform that you have. And I think you'll do the best service to Israel and to Israel-US relations that you can. Alad, thank you so, so much for this amazing and a powerful conversation. I learned a lot. I know the students learn a lot. So we really appreciate your time and you being here and teaching us. I know that uh, hopefully when campuses will be back, if we can invite you to visit some of our schools, I hope that you'll be able to do it. And we'll be more than happy to. Now we just need to go back to schools. Uh, and we hope that we can contain this virus. So please, everybody, keep safe, stay healthy, and don't forget these. They are important. <laughs> this is, by the way, if you don't see, there is hamsa on it. That's awesome. 
So thank you a lot. And also a big thanks again to Eden that uh, made this possible from Pace University, our president there. So, Eden is amazing. We love you, Eden. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.